Hey everyone, this is John. Um, so this is my second attempt at actually recording this. So um, yeah, basically what happened, my mic was off when I was recording it the first time around. So um, here I am. Uh, woohoo, round two. Anyways, uh, this is going to be my first recitation recording, not the first re recitation I've ever taught, but the online recording because coronavirus is bad. Yeah, um, but hope you guys stay safe during these times. But Let's get started with this. So what we'll be talking about today is stern Livio problems. So this will be chapter five of your textbook. So chapter five, stern Livio problems. And before we start this chapter, we're going to go through a very, very brief review of the types of BCs. So types of boundary conditions specifically. Review of boundary conditions. Okay. So uh, I think the very classic example of boundary conditions where we first started learning about this is with our friend, Mr. Rod. And let's say Mr. Rod is modeled by a function u of x t that models um, the temperature. And we decompose Mr. Rod into phi of x and h of time. So when we're looking at the spatial boundary conditions, so the phi of x term, um, we've seen a variety of boundary conditions. So for example, we've seen a boundary condition where we have zero is equal to L is equal to zero. And we would classify these type of boundary conditions as Dirichlet BCs. Likewise, if we had phi of X, so derivatives at each of these positions, both of them equal to zero, we would call these Newman boundary conditions. But if we had um, one of them being normal, so non-derivative, so this, let's say this was non-derivative, and the other one is a derivative, and they're both equal to zero, we would call these mixed boundary conditions. And the other type of boundary condition, which comes up, which has not really come up in previous problems, but is going to start coming up much more frequently in the future Math 240 problems, are Robin boundary conditions. And Robin boundary conditions usually take the form of phi of zero plus the derivative at that same position at zero is equal to zero and then some boundary condition on the other end. So we would call these Robin boundary conditions. So hopefully that was a quick review of the types of boundary conditions that we've seen before. Dirichlet, Newman, and mixed boundary conditions are probably the most um, recognizable. Robin boundary conditions are definitely new and are going to be interesting to deal with. So you'll, you'll see how these play down the road, but I just want to make sure that you guys get a sense of them. Okay, so let's delve into Stern Louisville now. So Stern Louisville is essentially a classification of differential equations. So these two scientists, Stern and Louisville, basically identified a, this Diffie-Q in its form and um, generated some properties of regular stern louisville problems. And we'll talk about all that, what I'm basically saying um, down this recitation. So I'm going to make sure to define this standard, standard stern louisville differential equation. And it takes the form of ddx px d phi dx plus q of x times phi plus lambda sigma x phi, oh, that's a terrible phi, is equal to zero. And this is the standard stern louisville differential equation. And although it looks like a bunch of garbage being thrown together, you guys have actually seen this come up very frequently. For example, we've seen this come up in the heat equation. Where has this come up before? So in the heat equation, we have the following relationship where u double x is equal to u of t, and then we um, do some separation variables, u of x phi, h of t, and our spatial function phi of x, um, our differential equation takes the form of d squared phi dx squared plus lambda phi is equal to zero. And if we decompose the double prime term, which I'm circling right here, we can equate it to putting this 
into a derivative form. And what you should be able to recognize at that is that this differential equation right here, which I'm drawing with an arrow, looks pretty similar to the standard sturm liouville differential equation. In fact, p of x here is equal to 1, q of x is equal to 0, and then sigma x is equal to 1. So therefore, that differential equation for the spatial, um, the spatial function for the heat equation is actually a standard sturm liouville differential equation. Likewise, we've also seen it come up in the wave equation. where we have uxx is equal to utt, um, u is equal to phi of x times h of t, and then the spatial function looks exactly the same as the spatial function for heat. So therefore, p, q, and sigma are also the same thing for the wave equation. So this is interesting. So the standard sturm liouville differential equation form is essentially a parent to a lot of the problems we're going to see in Math 241. And the whole point of sturm liouville problems is to essentially provide some information about differential equations that we might not necessarily be able to solve. Um, so in most, most FEQs that we encounter in Math 241 are solvable. For example, we know how to solve this one. We know how to solve this one. Um, we know how to solve cauchy euler but in actuality, a large majority of differential equations are actually not solvable using analytical techniques. And consequently, by identifying a problem as a regular sturm liouville differential equation, so we'll talk about regularity um, in just a moment, we're able to derive important properties of the differential equation that we would not be able to normally obtain without identifying regularity. So all that should make sense at the end of this recitation. So I'm just giving you guys sort of a um, a hint into what we're about to delve into. So, as I promised, we'll be talking about regular sturm liouville differential equations now. So, a regular sturm liouville diffie-Q um, has six properties that arise as a consequence of the regularity. So, I'll write this explicitly. A regular stern liouville Diffie-Q has six properties that are useful. However, these six properties are only true if the Diffie-Q is regular. So I'm going to repeat this over and over and over again. So p please try to get this in your head. So notice regular, regular. So um, some of you may have heard of the Rayleigh quotient or you've seen it in class or something. So the Rayleigh quotient is only applicable if the Sturm, if the differential equation is a regular sturm liouville Diffie-Q. If your Diffie-Q is not regular, then you cannot apply the Rayleigh quotient and you cannot apply the six properties directly. I'll definitely, I'll, I promise to be expounding on this later. Just giving some uh, foreshadowing. Okay. So what is a what what makes a sturm liouville problem regular? What is regular? In order for a differential equation to be considered a regular sturm liouville problem, all the following conditions must be satisfied. Must be true. The zero step is to make sure, oh sorry, make sure the Diffie Q is in Sturm Louisville form. Sorry, let's add standard right here. Standard, standard Sturm Louisville form, which is um, the form that I wrote up here. And I'll just copy and paste it down. So the reason for this, why this is considered step zero, is because um, the, the following properties mostly follow from the fact that your problem is actually in standard form. And if it's not in standard form, then we have an issue. Um, and this is from A to X to B. So these are the sort of the interval that we're looking at for this differential equation. So the first important step is that the boundary conditions 
have real coefficients. And what I mean by this is that you don't have imaginary coefficients on your boundary conditions. So what I'm going to write now is sort of the general form of boundary conditions. So beta 2, phi of a is equal to 0, beta 3, d phi dx, b, plus beta 4, phi b is equal to 0. So don't get bogged down by notation here. All this is is the general form, gen form of boundary conditions. So if I were to give you um, Dirichlet boundary conditions like above, so phi of zero equals phi of l is equal to zero, these boundary conditions basically just correspond to the cases where b1 and b3 are equal to zero and b2, b4 are equal to one. So notice how these boundary conditions right here are just the general form of the boundary conditions we'll encounter in Math 241. And all you need to check for this condition is that beta, all the values of beta are real. None of them are imaginary. And that should pretty be that should be a pretty easy check. The second condition is that is on the coefficients. The coefficients p, q, and sigma must satisfy two little two individual properties. So p, sorry, let's just write um, uh, actually p, q, and sigma are real and continuous everywhere, including endpoints. So what this is saying is that P, Q, and Sigma must be real and continuous over the interval that we're, we, we care about essentially, so from A to B, right? So a quick graph should hopefully clear any confusion up. So let's say we're taking a look at the differential equation over the range from A to B. So let's say our rod is located from A to B. And our function P looks like this. Um, still looks like this, but then suddenly it is discontinuous over here. And let's say it's like continuous, All right? So we're only taking a look at a window at this portion right here. So imagine zooming in such that you only look at A to B, right? So from a to b, our function p of x is continuous from a to b, including the endpoints, right? So it's continuous everywhere. However, it is definitely not continuous outside of the interval, but we don't care, right? It's only continuous inside the interval, and that's all that matters to us right now. The second condition is that p, uh, let's do um, p is, has to be greater than 0, and sigma must be greater than 0 everywhere from A to B, including the endpoints. So a similar sort of graph, A to B, of let's say sigma this time. Let's say sigma is nice and positive, but then suddenly drops onto a negative number down here. All right, so sort of thinking about the window sort of thing I was talking about earlier, we only care about the interval from A to B. And notice that from A to B, we are entirely positive. So sigma x is greater than 0 from A to B. And that's all that matters to us. We don't care that sigma is less than 0 over here because, frankly, that's just outside of our interval of interest entirely. So if all these conditions are true, so if your differential equation is standard form and your differential equation has um, real coefficient boundary conditions, and your coefficients satisfy both these mini properties, then our differential equation can be considered a regular stern louisville problem. So, if, if regular stern louisville diff EQ, then you can apply the six following um, properties. Then you can apply the six following properties. Well, I'll, I'll be expounding these properties shortly, but the, the theme is that if regular, then properties. However, if not regular, right? So you if you fail to prove even one of the, the sorry, if you fail to even prove that condition zero, one, or two, anything of, amongst those are false, then your problem cannot be regular. 
and if it's not regular then you cannot apply the six following properties okay so what are these properties I keep talking about so the six properties of regular stern loop result problems um, so I'm gonna quickly take this image from the book that I took a screenshot of uh, it's right here okay so the six properties of stern label of regular stern label problems is basically listed here so I'll talk through them briefly but we'll def we'll be expounding on them below let me cross this out again okay so the six properties right so First one, all the eigenvalues are real. The second one, there exists an infinite number of eigenvalues. The third one um, basically says that for each eigenvalue, there is a unique eigenfunction. The fourth one has to do with um, a Fourier series and representing an initial condition, essentially. The fifth one is about orthogonality, and the sixth one is about the rally quotient. So I'll talk about each one of these in detail. So I think the best way to talk about each of these in detail is to approach them with an exact example of a problem you've seen in the past. So let's use the heat equation, for example. So this will be example and application of the six properties. So the standard um, sort of uh, heat equation problem you'll find with the spatial part is d squared dx squared is equal to negative lambda phi, where you have Dirichlet boundary conditions. And if you convert this to its standard um, stern liberal form, you should find that um, p of x is equal to 1, q of x is equal to 0, and then sigma x is equal to 1. And in order, before we even apply the six properties, we have to make sure that this differential equation is regular. So going through the quick checks, is it in standard form? Check. Are the boundary conditions real? Are any coefficients on the boundary conditions not real? No. So therefore, check on condition one. And then condition two has two different pieces. Are P, Q, and sigma real and continuous entirely over our interval from zero to L? check and are p and sigma greater than zero from zero to l and that is also a check so therefore regular cool so that means we can apply the six um, properties of stern liberal problems and since we've solved this differential equation before we know that the eigenfunction is going to look like c um, some arbitrary constant c times sine n pi x over l lambda is equal to n pi over l squared where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, to infinity. Okay. So, taking a look at the first, bound, uh, first statement, all the eigenvalues are real. And if we take a look at our eigenvalues, we clearly see that they are all real. There's nothing um, imaginary. And originally in Math 241, we could have cased for lambda, um, lambda being imaginary, but that would have been a lot of work just to show that it never existed for stern Lugo problems in the first place. For some problems, however, lambda less than zero can exist, which is why we had you test them extensively in previous problems. But condition, condition one basic, sorry, property one essentially eliminates the possibility of imaginary eigenvalues, and that can simplify a lot of work down the road. Step two, uh, sorry, property two is that there exists an infinite number of eigenvalues. Infinite number of eigenvalues. And an extension of, a, so sorry, a sub-property of this is that there is a smallest but there is not a largest. And what I mean by this is if we take a look at our eigenfunction or our heat equation differential equation, we see that our smallest eigenvalue eigenvalue corresponds to the case where n is equal to 1, such that lambda 1 is equal to pi over L squared. 
and all other eigenvalues are going to be greater than that. But since there are an infinite number of eigenvalues, there's not a largest maximum eigenvalue. It can expand off to um, lambda 10, lambda 1 billion, lambda 1 trillion, up to infinity. So that's what uh, property 2 is basically saying. Um, let's take a quick look at property 3 now. So property 3 basically states that for each eigenvalue, there is a unique eigenfunction. Each eigenvalue has a unique eigenfunction. So looking at the n equals 1 case, we see that um, some water. Sorry. So for the n equals 1 case, we have the eigenfunction phi of 1, which is equal to sine, sorry, constant times sine pi o, sine pi x over l. For n equals, uh, let's say, 11, we have eigenfunction 11 is equal to c sine of 11 pi x over l. And maybe n equals 73, for example. Phi 73 is equal to c sine 73 pi x over l. And for any n, phi n is equal to c sine n pi x over l. So what this property states is that for each eigenvalue, for each case of n, we have a unique eigenfunction corresponding to it. Um, so the second part of the, this third property, which is interesting, states that, oh, let's not that one. Uh, phi of n has exactly n minus one zeros over the interval. So recall that our interval is from zero to L, right? So if we look at the n equals 1 case, um, and we draw the graph for this, uh, let's just look at the positive sector, actually, positive quadrants. So for, uh, for phi 1, we have some eigenfunction that looks like this, some sine curve. However, note that the sine curve ends right here at L. So that's the first 0, essentially. Note that there are 0 other occurrences of zeros inside of this interval, right? So no other zeros. And recall that this corresponds to phi 1 of x. So property 3 is basically stating that there are n minus 1 zeros for some eigenfunction n. And directly translating this, this says that there are n minus 1 zeros over 0 to l, which basically means that 1 minus 1 is equal to 0 zeros. And this is exactly what we see in this graph. Um, if we were to take a look at phi 2 instead, so phi 2, we would find that phi 2 sort of looks like this, roughly speaking, blah, blah, blah. And note how there's one zero right here. So this corresponds to the case where it's phi 2 of x. And phi 2 of x looks like c sine 2 pi x over l. So twice the frequency. Notice that the property is stating that phi of x, so phi 2, phi 2, we would expect it to have two, one, 2 minus 1 zeros over the interval sorry, over the interval from zero to L, exclusive of the bounds. So we would expect one zero. And lo and behold, what do we hold? There's only one zero over this interval. So this is what that property is essentially stating. It's stating the number of zeros that occur inside the, the interval from zero to L, exclusive of the boundaries. Number four, let's take a look back at the chart. Um, so basically property four is talking about uh, Fourier series expansions. So I think um, the most the easiest way to understand this property is by taking a look at how we apply our initial condition. So in applying our initial condition, we usually have a function that's like u of x zero is equal to f of x, and then we set u of x zero of our product solution equal to, at time equal zero, and then equate it to f of x. So we get something that looks like this. Um, 
Recall that our sine function is our spatial eigenfunction. So we can essentially equivalently write this as the expansion from a to n of phi n x equal to f of x. And all these two equations, these two equations are basically a, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the Fourier series expansion to model f of x. So in um, chapter three, where we did Fourier series problems, we tried to solve uh, for the specific coefficient such that an infinite linear combination of a of n times um, sine or cosine would be able to generate a graph of f of x. And these turn out to be really interesting problems if you chose to graph it out. If you try graphing it out, you'd actually notice that the oscillatory functions you use would actually start to model the initial condition or the f of x that you found. And this is kind of interesting because you're essentially modeling almost any type of curve, almost any type of shape using sine and cosine, like things that oscillate and you're modeling lines and parabolas. It's very interesting if you tried graphing it out or look at my solutions for that. So that's all that's really saying. So it's saying that you can use a Fourier series to um, find the coefficients. Property five is a statement about orthogonality. And it states that in order to solve for a of n, so if we're taking a look at the arbitrary form of solving for f of x, where we don't necessarily know what the eigenfunction is, so keeping in terms of phi of n, um, this is basically saying that a of n, when we apply orthogonality, is equal to um, a to b of f of x times phi of nx weighted by sigma x dx. And the same thing on the bottom, sigma uh, phi squared weighted by sigma x dx once again. And the parallel to the heat equation is that a of n is equal to from integral from 0 to 1, or 0 to l, sorry, of f of x times sine of n pi x over l dx bottom 0 to l sine squared of n pi x over l dx. And remember to note that um, sigma x is actually equal to 1, right? So here, the sigma x is actually not having much of a problem here, or it doesn't really change anything because the weight is actually just equal to 1. But in future Matthew 241 problems, or in stern Weaver problems in general, it is entirely possible that sigma is not equal to 1. Sigma can be equal to like e to the negative 4x, as I've seen in the past. So it's very important to be very careful about what you're choosing as your weight. And then property six is essentially the Rayleigh quotient. So the Rayleigh quotient is this big bundle of garbage that when you first look at, you're just like, what is this? It is scary looking. Um, it is long. It is intimidating. Um, but it is actually not that bad once you realize like what it actually is. So I'm just basically writing out the Rayleigh quotient right now. Thank God I've memorized this. Woohoo. Uh, minus q phi squared dx over a to b phi squared sigma dx. The Rayleigh quotient is used to give you a sense of the range of eigenvalues. So if you remember testing in the initial portion of Matthew 41, where you tested for like lambda greater than zero, lambda equal to zero, and lambda less than zero. The Rayleigh quotient gives you a qualitative idea of what the eigenvalues are going to be. You never do not do not explicitly try to evaluate the Rayleigh quotient. This is unproductive and more often than not will lead you to some pit pitfalls because you don't necessarily know what the spatial eigenfunction looks like and you don't necessarily know what the differential equation like this differential equation actually looks like the rally quotient to repeat myself is used to give you an idea of the range of eigenvalues so using the rally quotient on the heat equation you can uh, sorry using the rally quotient on the heat equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions you can quickly evaluate and take a, once you get once you get a sense of how to use it you can quickly evaluate cases like lambda equals zero and you can quickly evaluate lambda less than zero and if you remember how tedious it was to case for these lambdas originally, the Rayleigh quotient is the tool, 
the, the friend of the work smarter, not harder trend. So it is the kingpin of <laughs> like the, the epitome of work smarter, not harder. So the very, very useful tool. Okay. And before we look at a specific example of um, the uh, st stern Lebo problems, a common question that arises is what is the purpose? So what is purpose of stern Lebo? It just seems like a bunch of like differential equations and properties, blah, 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 blah. The major properties, the, the major purpose of stern Lebo, the major purpose of defining a problem as a regular stern Lebo problem is the fact that not every single stern Lebo problem can be solved under normal circumstances. Uh, sorry, not every differential equation can be solved under normal circumstances. So when I say this, I mean that um, some, stern, some differential equations can be solved via Cauchy-Euler method, but not everything can be solved using um, analytical techniques. Sometimes differential equations can only be solved numerically, but even these numerical differential equations can be used in such a manner such that you can actually garner some properties of them such as using the rally quotient to find out the range of eigenvalues involved. You can then, you can also conclude that there are no imaginary eigenvalues, for example. And this can be very, a very, st identifying regular stern lever problems can be an extremely, extremely powerful technique to get an idea of your differential equation and what its properties are and what its eigenfunctions and eigenvalues look like. Hopefully that makes sense. So let's delve into a very classic um, stern louisville exam problem. Um, this problem is from fall 2012, question five. And we're given a differential equation that looks like this. plus lambda x squared 1 plus 3 x squared phi is equal to 0. So our goal in this problem is to first, sh um, is to essentially show that it's a regular stern levo problem. So in order to do this, we have to put it into a standard stern levo form. And I'm just going to scroll all the way back up here to find the standard stern levo form. So notice that it doesn't look like pinpoint exact as the standard form, right? But if we expand out the standard form, what we should find is that we have dx squared plus dp dx d phi dx plus q of x phi plus lambda sigma x phi is equal to zero. Note how we can actually relate these two, these diff, um, sorry, these um, derivative operators to their coefficients, right? And this becomes a very useful technique because our goal now, what we, what we should intend to do is to multiply our given differential equation by some arbitrary function h of x, such that we can choose our h of x to convert the differential equation into standard stern Lebesgue form and then check if it's a regular problem. Well, let's do such that. So looking at this relationship right here where I'm drawing with arrows, what we should notice is that the, that the coefficient on um, d squared phi dx squared is the derivative, sorry, the coefficient, the coefficient on the second derivative term, which is what I'm circling right here, when we take the derivative of it, it's going to be equal to this term on the the, uh, the d phi dx term. Um, so let's take a look at what I'm saying more explicitly. So I know that was a little bit confusing. So let's go down here and pull this down. So when I multiply this by some function h of x, I'm going to have h of x here, h of x here. And knowing that in the expanded stern Louisville form, when we take the derivative of the coefficient on um, the, second, the second order derivative term, we're going to be equal to the coefficient on the first order derivative term. So notice these relationships right here that are popping up. 
This becomes very, very useful because we can actually solve for an explicit relationship on H such that um, it satisfies the, Stern, uh, the standard Stern label form. And then in solving this differential equation relationship that arises as a result of um, the standard form, you find that h of x is going to be equal to e raised to the 4x. And if we test this idea um, and multiply h of x across and then plug um, multiply h of x across, we should also notice that um, h of x, the h of x term here, corresponds directly to p of x. So therefore, we can just simply plug it back into the um, into standard form. Yeah, this is terribly explained, but hopefully once I write it out, it will all make sense. So we have e to the 4x times d phi dx. Remember that we're multi multiplying h of x across every single function? Plus, um, there's no q term, no q of x term, because q of x is equal to zero here, as we can see by the, the fact that there's no um, phi term that doesn't have lambda multiplied by it. Um, plus e to the 4x lambda x squared over 1 plus 3x squared phi is equal to zero. And let's rearrange this set up right here, uh, lambda e to the 4x. And let's take a look. So this has to be our p of x now, as I was saying earlier, and this is going to be our sigma x. So we know that q of x now is going to be equal to 0. And remember that we're trying to show that this is a regular problem. Um, so uh, step 0, um, standard in believable form. Let's check. Step one, are the boundary conditions real? I didn't give them to you just yet, uh, but they are in fact uh, just real. Um, I mean, it's just five zero equals five one is equal to zero. So clearly that is real. Um, now let's take a look at P and Q. So the first condition are P, Q, and Sigma real and continuous everywhere over interval yes oh i'm sorry the boundary condition is actually from one to two yeah okay no let's let's try this again so the boundary condition is real check are p q and sigma real and continuous everywhere um that is also check because none of none of these functions are discontinuous over our interval. Notice that this function on sigma right here, sigma is actually discontinuous at um at some point. I uh can't think of the top of my head. Actually uh yeah the nominator will never actually be equal to zero so it's actually never gonna be discontinuous so we should be good there. But just just be careful about uh, discontinuities over your intervals, essentially, is what I'm trying to say. And um, so condition two are P and sigma greater than zero over this interval, and absolutely they are entirely greater than zero over this interval, where e to the 4x is going to look like, e to the 4x is going to look something like this, and then uh, whatever this looks like, x squared over 1, 3x, 1 plus 3x squared is so maybe like that. I don't know. I haven't really graphed it but yeah they're, the point of emphasis is that they're real um, that they're greater than zero over the interval so since all these properties are satisfied we can conclude that this problem is going to be regular yay and that's an example of, of a stern believer problem to quickly overview what we did was that we were given um, this standard differential equation sorry we were given this differential equation and we tried to relate it to the standard stern leeville form, which is now boxed in green. And we expanded out the standard stern leeville form. I'm annotating in green right now. Expanded stern leeville form. And we noticed that there was a relationship on the derivative, the coefficients of the various derivative um, operators. So namely this one and this one and their coefficients. 
Um, and then what we did was we found the relationship on the coefficients, which was that the derivative of um, the term on the derivative on uh, the derivative of the coefficient on the um, square term, so the d squared d phi d x squared is equal to the term found on the d phi d x term. We solved that differential equation to solve for h of x and then plugged everything in such that we were able to reconvert into standard term relieval form and then check if the problem was in fact regular. So another um, classic term relieval problem, I suppose, is, uh, let's see what midterm, let's see what finals is. Spring 2016. Oh, let me find the question. Question five, I see. Question five. And this gives us a differential equation of the form d squared phi dx squared plus two over x d phi dx plus lambda over x phi zero from the interval one to two. And the first thing we're told to do is to put this into essentially regular, where we're essentially told to prove that this is a regular problem. So in order to do that, we have to approach this with the same way we were doing earlier. So let's find out what the def, uh, let's find the standard stern leave form. Let's just copy the entire thing down. Let's bring it down here. And we know that the expanded form of this thing looks like, I'll just rewrite it without all the marks. So P of X, uh, D phi D squared DX, I'm gonna write this in brief notation, phi double prime plus P of X prime, phi prime, of, uh, phi prime plus Q phi plus sigma, sorry, lambda sigma of phi is equal to zero. So we have to multiply this given differential equation by some function h of x, such that we can reassemble it into the, 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 the desired standard stern liberal form. And going with the same logic in the problem that we did earlier, we're going to find a relationship on the coefficients so that we can use some um, integration factor to find it. So what do we notice here? We notice that the coefficient on the phi double prime term and the phi prime term um, are derivatives. Uh, so the derivative of the coefficient on the phi double prime term is the coefficient on the phi prime term. Sorry if you hear anything in the background, that's a video uploading right now. So if I take the derivative of h of x so what I'm underlining green corresponds to one another. So these must be the same coefficient. So P of X must be each equal to H of X. I'll actually underline this in green. I'm sorry, underline this in blue. So P prime must be equal to here. So therefore, we see that H prime must be equal to H of X um, times two over X. So if we solve this diffy Q out, so we have um, DH uh, 1 over h is equal to 2 over x dx, and we take the integral of both sides. What we should find is that this is the natural log of h um, is equal to 2 times the natural log of x. So if we raise both sides to the e, we um, so I know there's a plus c here, but the plus c we're just going to call it equal to 1 such that when we erase both sides equal to um when we raise both sides equal to when we raise both sides to the e power all we get is um 2x so if we multiply 2x across we can essentially test out our theory and see if it actually works oh sorry that was stupid so this will lead to here, and then we'll get um, x squared. Sorry, my bad, that was really dumb. Cool. And then we can quickly test this by plugging it in. So we have x squared, uh, phi double prime now, 
plus 2x phi prime plus x squared, uh, actually just x times uh, lambda times phi is equal to zero. And then we can condense this into x squared phi prime dd, actually I'll just write in, stand, um, in annotated notation so you guys can get used to it, times phi x phi, uh, sorry, lambda phi x. So we notice that if we take the product rule of this stuff right here, it will become this, and if we backtrack our steps, it becomes all the way back up here to the original Diffie Q, where h of x is equal, h of x is equal to x squared. Great, so this works. So we know now that p of x is going to be equal to x squared, sigma x is equal to x, and q of x is equal to zero. And in order to continue with this problem, we have to check that this Sturm Lever problem is regular. So another theme of this recitation. So um, zero standard form, check uh, boundary conditions. Um, I haven't given you the boundary conditions yet, so I should probably give you that now. So we have interesting boundary conditions this time. So our boundary conditions are given as follows. d phi dx at one minus three phi one is equal to zero and d phi dx at two is equal to zero. So these are Robin boundary conditions. But notice that all the coefficients are real. So therefore that's also satisfied. Second condition, um, second point is checking on P and Q. So P, Q, Sigma are real and continuous from one to two. And P, Q, sorry, P, Sigma are both greater than zero over one to two. So that's checked. So therefore this, this differential equation, the original differential equation we were given is in fact a regular Stern Louisville Diffie Q. Smiley face. Um, so now the second part of this problem asks, so the question is show that the evals are non negative. So the way to do this is by evaluating our differential equation over the rally quotient. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly copy it down here so we can just plug and chug our way through. So as I said earlier, the rally quotient is used to get a qualitative sense of what the eigenvalues are going to be. So in this question, our goal is to use the rally quotient to show that none of the eigenvalues are negative. So let's plug in all the values. So negative um, p, so x squared, just to make sure we got our values right here. So right here, x squared, um, x and zero. So x squared dx at 1 to 2 plus 1 to 2 at x squared d phi dx squared dx 1 to 2 phi squared x dx and just to double check we should be good to go okay so let's start evaluating our boundary conditions so note that we have this Robin boundary condition, which I'm going to copy and paste down here. And we're going to try to plug our way through across the rally quotient to try to simplify it a little bit. And our focus is on this term right here. So what we have is negative two squared phi of two. So what I'm doing is I'm evaluating the stuff I'm, under, I'm I've underlined in green. Uh, let's actually put the negative on the outside. So we have um, 2 squared uh, phi 2 d phi dx 2 minus 1 squared phi at 1 and d phi dx at 1. We know that d phi dx at 2 is equal to 0. So therefore, this entire side of the equation goes to 0. But we have a relationship on um, on these things right here via the Robin boundary condition where I'm pointing right now. So this this Robin boundary condition basically says that d phi dx at one is equal to three phi at one. 
So we can plug either value in vice versa into this portion of the equation. So we'll get that negative one uh, and I'm gonna plug it in for the derivative portion. So we get that um, phi one times positive three phi at one. And this relationship tells us that phi at that this first term must be a positive number because we end up with three phi one squared. Okay, so if we plug this back into our original Rayleigh quotient equation, we're gonna find that we have three phi squared at one. So that must be a positive number because of squared plus the integral of everything still here. Um, over this stuff on the bottom. Okay, um, let's quickly make sure that we've used the correct Rayleigh quotient. Cool, let's quickly make sure our sigma is the correct value. Great. So let's scroll back down. Okay. So now we have to do a piecewise evaluation of everything to determine if the eigenvalues are going to be positive or negative or zero. So in order for the eigenvalues to be negative, we have to have a negative somewhere, right? So on each of these terms, we know that on each of these terms, we're going to take a look if any of them can possibly be negative. So this has to be positive, as I was saying earlier. This term is x squared, so it's going to be positive across the interval. This term is always going to be positive as well because we're squaring it. This term is always going to be positive because the function squared is always positive. And then this x term, although it's not necessarily positive, note our range of integration. Remember that um, for x, I'll draw this in black. And then remember that for x, it's just a line, right? So everything x here is negative, so this is negative. But note that our integration bound from 1 to 2. So all our values for x are going to be positive. So therefore, this is going to be positive. So therefore, our eigenvalues cannot be negative, right? So that quick analysis shows that eigenvalues cannot be negative. Great. Now, the last part of this question asks us whether or not lambda equals 0 is an eigenvalue. So in order for lambda equals zero to exist, if we take a look at this rally quotient again, I'm just gonna to try to remove everything that was not relevant. Uh, no, uh, there we go, okay. In order for lambda equals zero to be an eigenvalue, we, the only way for this to be true is for the numerator to be equal to zero. If the denominator were equal to zero, we would be undefined and that's kind of useless. So what we can essentially do is ignore the denominator because we know that the numerator is the only thing that can be equal to zero in order to suffice our condition. And for lambda equals zero to exist, there must be some way that um, everything on top is equal to zero. So if you guys take a look at this, right? So for lambda equals zero to possibly exist, lambda could be equal to zero, let's say if phi were a constant. Right, because the derivative of a constant is just going to be equal to zero. So this is essentially proof by contradiction, whether or not lambda equals zero can exist. So we're, we're saying that phi is a constant, okay? So if phi is a constant, then this right side term must go to zero. So therefore we have three phi squared at one. This relationship to be true, so the relationship of the arrow, phi squared at one, so phi at one must be equal to zero. However, remember that phi, well, I'll write proof of contradiction here. Remember that phi is equal to a constant. So if phi at the end is equal to zero and phi is a constant, this would suggest that phi everywhere is equal to zero, which is just the trivial solution. So therefore, phi, oh sorry, therefore lambda cannot equal zero because that would result in phi being the trivial solution. So therefore in this problem, only lambda greater than zero.
So notice how this casing was much more rapid and efficient than testing each individual case out. And in fact, if you try to test each individual case out, you'd have a lot of difficulty. Because notice that this differential equation, this diffy Q right here, which I'm circling in orange, is really, 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 really hard to solve. Um, I would not really want to solve that on my own. It's not really, it's not a Cauchy-Euler problem. It's just a pain in the butt. So you can't really solve it explicitly. So like I was saying earlier, not every single differential equation can be solved analytically. This diffy Q can only be solved numerically. So therefore, we can't really solve this diffy Q exactly to find eigenvalues like we had before. But using the properties of regular stern Liouville differential equations, we were able to figure out a relationship on it such that we can get a sense of what the eigenvalues are, for example, or what the eigenfunctions are going to look like. So I hope this helped. Um, these notes will be uploaded to my website. Um, please let me know if you have any questions on my piazza. It's much preferred if you guys ask me questions there because I can actually respond much more quicker. I will, I will probably not be checking YouTube replies very frequently, so um, this is just me being honest. But please stay safe during this coronavirus season. Um, yeah, John out.